Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining on such short notice as well. And it's actually really cool. The number of questions we are able to get literally in like 24 hours. Cool. Firstly, I've grouped together questions about Zenotes itself, and then we'll get into kind of my experiences with the A-levels, tips and advice and things to kind of use from there. And then there will be kind of some more like just questions about like the day-to-day -day activities, you know, which notes are going to be created next and updates and all that sort of stuff. And then finally, we'll see if there are any more things about my own experiences that can help kind of provide more guidance to you guys if you can learn from my mistakes or whatever. First question, let's talk about, well, Zenote itself, how it all started and everything. I've kind of like, there are little bits of everything on the, on the internet. There's some bits on the website, but how I started the website and everything. I thought like, because obviously, you know, we're constrained with time or text space for me that I've never been able to kind of give the whole story. And I actually start slightly further back than my GCSE. So basically back in year nine, so it was actually the year before we even started GCSEs. I had this kind of idea to kind of work with the students in my year group to help create um, resources that could help the whole year group. So what I did was I just kind of like recruited or I don't know, spoke to my friends and students who are doing well in those kind of subjects that they were studying. And we, in some ways, there was like the, kind of the most alpha version of Xenos. It was just like five or six kids from different, from our whole year group who sat, sat together and wrote notes for whatever subjects they were studying and we put it all together. There's some really, really awful drafts. Like we, it was like, it was crazy because we're all like, you know, all this, everything that you see now is like this whole two column design and all that sort of, so that's all been refined over and over again. At that time, you know, we were messing around, testing new stuff, some ideas. And so that was our kind of a first iteration, if anything, of the concept of where I thought, you know, what if we can get students to kind of create the resources and what if we can, put it together in such a way that it's accessible to everyone. Um, that's how it started. Uh, that was when I was, I don't know, 15, 14, I don't even remember. Um, I got to GCSEs. Again, I was experimenting. I had, I studied my IG math as a first subject. I, I took it a, um, a year early. And that was like kind of like I was experimenting with notes at that time. Um, I created the first kind of versions at that time and then I had IG, ICT, I took it as a winter exam. And then those were all like, if there are some old versions, I guess the guys were looking at it the other day when we were updating the notes. There are some like really like 80, 90 page long sets of notes. It was crazy. We were all like kind of working out how would things work out best. And so kind of got kept going, getting refined. I had a really good set of notes from my GCSEs and that's really where it all started. I thought, you know, let's, let's do something with this. There are such... Well, I've put a lot of effort into it and it's just pressing to put it back in a box and like forget about them. I am someone, I'm a hoarder, so I have every set of books or notes from back when I was in the nursery. And like, I don't know, I imagine I'm going to open them at some point in my life and try to read through them and look at them. So the fact that this kind of idea of like putting stuff away was just like, it just made me, you know, it, was a little, it didn't feel right. So I thought, you know, what if definitely will be relevant a couple of years at least, a year it was 2014 then, so 2015 and 16 would have been, you know, the notes would have been fine for that. So that's when Z notes, or not even Z notes actually, it was something like Z study notes or something like that, dot blogspot or wordpress.com. It started off and we kind of like just let it grow from there. I then went into my A-levels. Um, I had two very close friends who worked with me to work on the, the AS subjects I was studying. And at that time, it changed a bit, this kind of angle where there were like a, a couple more people coming since the GCSE years. And there were also a few more kind of just the way we were doing it was we were releasing notes during the actual year as well. So lots of people were actually studying and reading the notes at the same time. Yeah, so basically that's how it all started. And then things like the Slack community happened. And there was a question about, you know, where did I get these gems from? Well, these gems who are managing this community have helped build this website up to where it is, make sure that the notes are updated and corrected and all the things that I've, even in the past month I have had um, my university exams with. These guys have been really pushing and making everything happen. That was all during 
kind of the, the days I had the Slack community running and then these and these ki- these guys, Adarish and Kuru and all these people started talking about just interacting with me and they saying, you know, I want to help in this, you know, whatever. And the best part about it is like they're, all they are is just passionate about what they want to do. The resources kept expanding. Lots of people emailed me at the beginning. I remember some of the first sets of notes were something like IG, English and business and stuff where yes and so had no ideas of how to like handle those subjects because i'd never studied them and yet it just went really well and you know the fact that everyone is really really passionate about what they want to do they there's like not once have i ever spoken about you know is there going to be some sort of reward and the worst part about it is like i've heard more adults speak to me about the fact that oh how are you going to make money off of this or make some sort of you know never once have any of these guys come to me and said, oh, how can, oh, is there going to be any kind of benefit for me, some monetary kind of incentive or anything like that? Never. And I think if there's a reason which continues to drive me, is the fact and the passion that's not just from the team, the contributors, but the whole community on its own. Um, everyone is just really, really passionate and want to just share their information, share the resources. We're in it together. And I think it's really difficult for anyone to understand, even you know, at school and teachers, adults, they, they don't really get it because I'm not sure if they've, maybe they have experienced bits of it, but like the way we have it, the way we're connected at every moment of our lives with different people around the world, the way we are not just connected, but we also have that kind of understanding that literally our lives are dependent on each other's. So I don't know who is, you know, doing something in the, on the other side of the world, which I will kind of get interacting with interacted with in a couple of days a couple of hours because things are changing so fast things are moving so quickly whether it's like manufacturing and goods and products and services everything um and kind of appreciating how small the world is and that's really like what changed and what made xenos possible because even maybe even a couple of years before when i started this it wasn't really possible with old internet connections and trying to like use dial-up modems and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's it just happened at the correct time with the correct people. And I was just lucky to find a kind of a community behind me that really pushed and continued to bring what you know, it is. That's kind of a long preamble to where it started, how it's got to, where it has kind of. I guess to kind of come to the stage of, yeah, we are here now, what are we doing next? Well, some really good questions about what, you know, what the community and the team is kind of what they should be doing next. I think from the beginning, I've always envisioned and seen, like before we even had Slack or Discord, we've always seen that kind of, there were always people helping each other out. So in the beginning, it was like WordPress comments or something like that. And you could see people asking questions, getting answers. And that was really, really amazing because, you know, people who don't know each other from across the world, in the same boat so they're helping each other out and actually gaining a lot of benefit getting a lot of value because of course the notes provide kind of this canon they provide a framework for someone to be like it brings people together in some ways right it's and the people that come with it some of them are obviously not going to be super helpful someone someone to stay for a few seconds and download and go away someone to commit to the people around them and I'm really interested in the fact that we can build a community, we can build kind of a cult tribe sort of thing, the, the way we've done it around each set of subjects, each set of examination board. And you know, it doesn't have to stick with GCSEs, A-levels. It doesn't have to stick with even that age group. It can go up, down, it can scale into universities, it can scale into exam boards. I see the fact that somehow having some sort of main framework at, at the core of it, you know, so whether it's for a different exam board, you know, at the beginning, I think it's very important to have some sort of kind of canon that you can always refer to, you know, you know that you need to know these certain things for your exams, because that's what, that's the only way you're going to perform it then. We haven't come up with any better educational system, which doesn't rely on examinations. So if we're going to have to go back and at the end of the year, try to perform in a two hour slot, well, not how many, how long these exams are, but we're working in a, in a system that's already existing. It's existed for hundreds of years. Um, but what we can do, we can't, we probably, you know, we can try 
but there's different ways of approaching this problem. I can go bang my hands across the walls of different education institutions and say that we should change the way we do stuff, or we can take things into our hands. We can change the way we're doing stuff ourselves. And if we have enough momentum, enough power to create some sort of framework, some sort of concept that helps us move forward, we're working and we're getting, we're improving, we're getting further ahead of our educational journeys without, you know, having to change the world or the educational system itself. We've hacked it inside out. So that's the idea. We're going to try to build a dynamical system to be able to support this. Because obviously, as you've seen, there's so many people who want to interact and kind of contribute. There's so many people that are pointing out errors. And one of the questions was about, you know, um, lots of errors are being pointed out. How can we do it so that the notes get updated much quicker? And that's 100% true. And it's kind of really like our responsibility because especially because we're coming out and we're saying that we have these resources for you to make sure that we're as error free as possible. Of course, that's not like it's impossible to complete, you know, be 100% incorrect, 100% correct. But what we're trying to do is if we have a system which allows us to update in real time, then we will not face these issues where we have a backlog. It's really, it's, it's a huge task if you, the team works tirelessly on it, but even then we have hundreds of documents. Every, you guys might be looking at a certain set of subjects instead of a certain set of notes, but they're like literally hundreds of documents that we have to handle, create, produce, and update. There's lots of little things that go on with each set of notes. So it takes a bit of time. Well, that's kind of the idea. We want to build the community aspect of it, build the ideas where students are helping each other out maybe add more kind of structure to it because right now it's quite open. And then we want to build a dynamical system which kind of displays, changes, updates the notes in real time and makes it much more accessible because right now PDF documents are kind of going, you know, in a different direction. We want to use the resources on our phones. We want to use resources in every possible way. Maybe print them out at the end, but we also want them in a much more flexible formatting. So that's kind of what we're going to be working on in the next couple of months. That's kind of what Z Notes is, where it is, and what we're going to do. Let's, um, Darsh, you want to come in and tell me any other questions which people have asked? Is there anything? Okay, there was one about involving the community with the development in the future. And I think that's just like, what does the Z Notes team expect from the community in general and plans on the community in general, that kind of thing? Yeah, well, I think kind of, you know, a lot of things that we've done, you know, we, with you as well, Darsh, it was never like, you know, we picked you for a certain role and then thought that, oh, this is what Darsh is going to do. And then we're going to kind of keep going with it. It's like we, we really are hacking it all together. We're trying to make the best of what we have, the resources and the talent and skills. So I think the best and what I'm hoping from the community is just to continue this kind of collaborative spirit that exists even now. Maybe it gets a bit um, over the top in some channels, but like we're kids, we got to do that. Um, but in general, if overall I've seen some great, great kind of interaction in the subject channel specifically, I'm seeing how people are asking the right questions, being pointed to the right directions. And if that continues to progress, that'll be amazing. At some point, maybe I'll also go into kind of the more specific features. There's an idea of having resource banks. So maybe the Z notes are, you know, create resources to revise from at the end of the year. Or maybe they're good to know what you need to know for a subject. So maybe while you're studying, you can say, okay, I might need, this is a chapter, these are the definitions, and these are the examples I need to know. But obviously, you're not going to be able to learn everything from it because, you know, in the end of the day, we've tried to concise and make it as short as possible. So what another idea we've had, we want to hope to develop, and it really brings the community involved, um, involvement with it, is this idea of resource banks. So for example, we're reading a set of you know chemistry notes about some topic like diffusion. Obviously, there's a definition for diffusion, and we read it, and we're like, okay, kind of, I don't know, I can't visualize it. Maybe I don't understand it as much as I want to for kind of like the conceptual knowledge. And we do want to kind of keep promoting the idea that we're not providing like a quick fix or a solution, you know, for last minute revision. In the end of the day, I want to be able to provide the fact that these resources are going to help you understand better and also make sure that you do well in your exams. The idea is that what if we can bring other resources from around the internet? So there are amazing YouTube videos out there now. There are some great 
web pages, there's some other resources, notes, past papers, you know, all these huge amount of resources out there that we can kind of connect with the notes themselves. And that would work really well to go from just reading the notes to actually learning about the actual subject as well. And so that's kind of one of the ideas that we want to get the community involved with and helping with error corrections and just making sure this collaborative spirit stays alive. So I think uh, we can pick one from what has already been submitted to us earlier. There's one interesting thing from uh, Uru. So if it so happens that failure seems to be what a student may see even after completing A2, is there any way of changing that perspective? And what would you like to say for students who have no idea what they should be doing after they're done with A2s and things like that? So Zubair, what is your thought on that? It's kind of a tough question. Honestly, failure is kind of part of the journey that we need to go through to get to what we think is success. And again, failure and success is quite, you know, philosophically debatable. I would say that, hmm, I'm not sure, I'm trying to think of an example in my life that kind of where I was at a crossroad and had to think, you know, where I'm going. Definitely certain times during, especially near my A2s when I was kind of applying to my universities and trying to like, not you know, maybe even hearing a rejection or so. And my life was always built on this idea that I'm going to go into some certain university. And suddenly this whole plan that was kind of formed and has been for many, many years, it just kind of fell apart in an email or two. And so I guess things like that happen. I applied to quite a few universities um, in the US, mostly in the UK though. Um, I didn't get into Oxford. I was I applied for a map there as well. Um, and obviously, like Oxford, Cambridge, that's kind of the dreams. Um, and I wasn't like I wasn't kind of for a while. I was quite pointed, as you can imagine. Um, but I guess one of the things which kind of is a negative and a positive thing about me is I'm kind of relentlessly optimistic. Um, so that means that I kind of like if something goes wrong, I'll somehow make myself believe that it's okay. And so when it came, you know, when the university picking time came, it, I just ended up choosing what I was doing. I came to uni and I made myself believe that where I was was the best possible place for me. And that's not 100% true, but I think a lot of it is about the attitude and angle with which you approach a certain situation. So if you can kind of convince yourself to believe that there are you know, you've been put in a certain position, in a certain place in the world, in a certain kind of, you know, degree or whatever you're trying to do. Um, if you can somehow like bring your head across the idea that this is kind of where you can excel at, you have a certain set of tools and skills and you just try to make the best of it, um, is an approach I always do in every scenario, in every case, it's not just education, but like socially and emotionally and physically, wherever I am, we are all kind of part of this universe, part of this world with a certain set of unique talents and skills and experiences. No one is ever going to be like us or our, it's, it's impossible because no one is going to make those exact tiny decisions that we've made to make ourselves get to where we are. And so whatever most irrelevant kind of experience, whether it's something you, you did as a five-year-old or a six-year-old or at 20 or 25, those little experiences, those times with friends, those times with family, they've made you who you are and you are different. I think if you can appreciate that, the fact that you can, you know, that you are developed and built for a certain purpose in, in this universe, um, I think that's kind of more, it gives you a bit more kind of vision of where you sit in the world. You know, you, you have a reason to be here and you need to use whatever things you have which you've been specially endowed with to make the best of you know your situation. I don't know if that's a very good answer. It's a very um, windy philosophical answer. Maybe if I can add a bit to it uh, regarding failure or success is more of a perspective, in my opinion. And uh, if you do look at it, failure is actually more important than success. 
because it teaches you something as to where you went down and you could build on it later on in life. And when people tell you, you know, when people come up to you and tell you, hey, you've not succeeded, you've not done well, what they're saying is they're saying, my image of success, you've just not achieved that. You know, that's just not how it works. Uh, you need, you define what success is and you go after it, you chase after it, and it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy, but you go after what you like, okay? And and there are going to be disappointments. Life is going to be an up and down journey, so you are going to have to deal with it. And there is hope always at the end of a, of the tunnel, so do not give up, okay? AS, A2, college, whatever. There's always, like, it's it's like what, you know, uh, Hawking says, right? Uh, look up at the stars. Don't look down on your feet. There's always something you can do in life and excel at. There's always that little something. So uh, focus on a silver lining. That's good, for us. Uh There's one from Alia. Uh, so she's put up a qu- pretty interesting question. How do you know a career is the right one to pursue for you? Because I'm in a serious dilemma about medicine. The negatives seem to be outweighing the positives. How do you know? Yeah, um, maths is it for me. So, Zubair. Question. It kind of builds from the previous one about um, defining failure and success by choosing, you know, the perspectives about it. I, when I chose math, there was never, I had no career idea. And to be honest, I still don't have any plans for my career. I've chosen, I chose it simply because of my passion for it. I didn't know anyone from my family, extended family, friends, teachers, school. I had not met a single person in my life who'd studied math at university. Um, I am not even, like even my, within my family, I'm just like a, this is my second generation at university. I'm not even, like, it's not as if our family's been through higher education for many years anyway as well. So choosing something like math, especially from a family background where we're kind of like, let's be open and honest about it, right? Our families and lots of kind of culturally we're forced to think about things like medicine and engineering to be literally the only paths <laughs> to take. Coming from that sort of environment, I definitely got a lot of disapprovals. Oh God, talk about them. I, I got, I got my, my own math teacher said, Zubair, what the hell are you planning to do? And yet... I'm here. I, I, I have had times when I thought that was what. What am I studying? What I don't even know half the things that are going on in my lectures, and yet I don't think I could have made a better decision. And again, it's it comes back to my relentless optimism. It's part of the reason why Xenos has got to where it is because I'm just bloody relentlessly optimistic about this. Right? I'm just gonna keep pushing and pushing until I see what I want. It's about it's 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 the way I approach everything. Um, I think that really, really helps you. It's it's characteristic, obviously, but I don't think it's I don't think it's like an exclusive. You're born with it or not. You kind of have to put it on yourself. We are all given the difficult times in our lives. No doubt about it. Like uh, we can talk about each of our kind of like weak or like difficult stages of our lives where we thought like everything was going wrong. But you take those experiences, those weaknesses, those failings. And you turn them into something that's more powerful for you. It's what drives you. And so going back to a bit more about like specifically, okay, career wise, um, I didn't know that math was a thing for me. I didn't know I was going to apply for math until the last two, three months. I thought I was going to apply computer science engineering. Then I thought physics. And then I thought natural sciences. And then I thought math. Um, so there's there's no wrong or right answer. There are way there. Are, weaknesses and strengths to every decision you take. And honestly, it's about taking a decision and being responsible for it and making the best out of it. You can obviously research, see what fits. At the time, I wasn't very kind of aware of things around me. I didn't spend much time researching what my, even what my degree course looked like. And yet when I came in, I was like overwhelmed with what, where people had come from and what they were doing. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting journey. And it's, it really is about the kind of, the passion you have for whatever you want to study, because that's what drives you. Medicine is a, a hugely time-consuming, effort-consuming, emotionally consuming, every sort of consuming. Like, but then every degree is right. I haven't. I've been going to the library every day for the past month, from what I don't know, nine to 
I don't know. I, I wake up to the library, I come back to do this talk. So like that's it. You choose something that you're going to stick with and you make the most out of it. It's always that. It's like, I think one of the most important things I think of, like are characteristics that have brought me to where I am is, is consistency as well. If I choose to do something, I'll, I will make sure that I can continue to do it because we are all, we all have the kind of like the determination to do something for a day or two. It's really about when you can make that task, that hobby, that, that certain beneficial thing in your life to be a, to be a consistent part of your, not even, I would say it's part of your kind of like your lifestyle, right? If you develop what you are passionate about into your lifestyle, then it'll never seem like you're working or you're studying. It'll always feel like you're doing something for something you love. So, and I'm not saying that this is like, uh, like, you know, maths is my lifestyle. Cause no, I'm definitely not even close to some of the guys that in my own cohort who are like, who live, eat and breathe math or whatever subject that you study. Um, but there's no reason why you can't fake a lot of things. Half the, <laughs> everything you do is about faking it and you fake it and you somehow it, it ends up like kind of being part of your life. So yeah, I think that's, I would take it. I would say that just research, find out what fits for you best. But remember that in the end of the day, if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to be able to make out of it. So do we want to um, go for another question? Yeah, there was this, um, yeah, Fury had a, I mean, sorry, sorry, he had a, quite an interesting question here. If you had the option to restart life, would you? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of out of the context, but what do you think? Can I steal this one? Okay, because I actually had this in my Stanford interview question as one of my questions. Um, so my answer was absolutely not for two main reasons. One, because um, I had to accept the fact as a way, like um, before I even joined Zenotes, as a way, like there's no way I can get back any sort of years. And something like that would only kind of force you back into a fantasy land, like, oh man, if I did that, if I did this. And it's sort of like the butterfly effect. You know how one small thing previously changes your life right now. And let's just say my email to Z one day changes, changed exactly, literally changed where I am right now physically speaking as well. And so something like that. Now imagine you're here 17 years and you've got another 60 to 80 years left. What if you just change one small thing now? There's still so much more that you could catch up on. And so I think I would not go back. You could go back and try, I don't know what, catch up on 20 years of things. But even after that, you'll never be happy because there'll always be that one extra bit always. Time, it's such a crazy concept. It's the only thing that we can't really contain. I studied general relativity last term. It was just crazy because you can now certain time becomes a manifold on, well, you get the space time manifold. It's just crazy. But yeah, time. I don't think, uh, we have so little time on our life in this kind of this planet. Like it just, it hurts to think back and think about all the time we've wasted on certain things. You know, whether it's like sitting on our Instagram account, scrolling, or I don't know, it just feels like how much of our lives have we actually put into some sort of beneficial thing on this planet. Um, I like to take this kind of philosophical approach or kind of like this, this mantra or this idea where I think what I like my purpose in life is basically to create an impact in as many other lives as possible. And I think that's the way I've gone about it. Um, and that obviously reflects straight into what I do with my time. Um, if I can make every moment of my time most productive, it doesn't have to mean that I'm studying 24 hours or I am, you know, working on Zenote stuff or anything. It just means that whatever I'm doing is somehow creating an overall positive change in the people, the world, and the environment, and the, in the animals and plants, and, the, and everything that's around me. That's that's what's the most important thing for me. And if you start kind of like again, it's it's very wishy-washy, but it also like 
we know when you say stuff enough, you kind of start to like, it starts to like inculcate inside you. It starts to kind of develop and breathe and develop within you. So you want to you kind of want to like feel this all the time when you're feeling like, like there isn't much to do. You, you, you try to work out, Oh, what can I do to make this certain period of my time to interact or to, to meet or to, to make some sort of positive change in the people or things around me. And so when you keep doing that, you certainly make time for everything. I don't know. Like, uh, it's crazy. Cause like, I don't think I ha- like, obviously at high school, I was doing my GCSEs and it was just relatively, it's not much. Um, and we had so much free time. We had our parents and family helping us And here while I'm at university. I'm doing literally day to day activities, running a household, traveling, making sure the bills are paid and the groceries in the house cooking, cleaning, everything. And I'm studying for a degree and I'm managing Z notes and I'm training and developing kind of physically. And I'm doing a lot more extracurricular activities and I'm interacting socially and I'm doing, I, I, I don't know, I feel a billion times more what I was, than what I was doing in a certain day. Like what I do, what I do in a day in my life today is more than I do in a whole week. No, I don't game. No, that's one thing I don't know how to do. Just, my sisters beat me at every possible video game there is. I just can't. Oh well. Um, you win some, you lose some. But what I mean is that you, it's crazy how much you can do. And then I'm a bad example compared to the hundreds of people out here who are doing so much more than me. We look at examples like you know, what is the what were the things they're talking about? Elon Musk, how he managed different like businesses on the same day. He has a certain day for a certain company a certainty for another how like these top businessmen he doesn't function on days man he has like 100 hour weeks it's all just about honestly the bigger picture it's it, it really is it's about and so find that kind of inner thing that drives you and burns within you um i i think for me it's something like this kind of the phrase of you know making as much impact in the people around me as much as possible and if that that's what works for you maybe there's something else if there's a specific reason, there's a specific goal that you have in mind. But if you start like kind of like hammering at it, like, oh, a reminder that tells you to, oh, look at this, or, you know, you, you have post-it notes. I don't know what, what works for you, but um, if there's a certain direction and drive to what your bigger picture in life is, as soon as you have that perspective that you are going to do something and you want to achieve something, you want to get to somewhere, you certain you kind of start to make time for yourself. It's it's it starts to form by itself. That's what I think. That's how I would approach it. Before we get into too much philosophical stuff, there's a couple of questions about subjects and stuff. There are subjects, so there's Malay and Indo, Indonesian, I guess, sociology and English language. Again, let's going back to what how Xenos works is basically we we just like I started with a couple notes and I just, the actual research itself attracts high achieving, well time committed students who want to just help others. And that's how resources and notes get developed. That's, we don't, and I would hope you would appreciate that. It's not like a, a guy sits there, reads a syllabus and writes notes from a textbook or something like that. Cause then how are we any different from any other textbook publisher out there? The way we go about it is that get someone who's studied the subject or is studying that subject someone who is passionate about it, someone who's doing well at it. You know, you, you do have to get your A's and A stars in those subjects. Once you have that kind of, that sort of person who's willing to commit to the time to make the resources, then you start creating notes for them. So it's not like um, you can have a certain like, oh, today sociology notes are gonna be up. It all depends on who wants to help, how much they wanna help, and how the team works together and makes the notes happen. So that's kind of the answer for all of those subjects. Um, someone asked about AP subjects. Again, we're, like I said in my initial discussion as well, I really think that the kind of the concept of Zenotes isn't limited to any exam board or subject or even exam level. Like, it doesn't have to be GCSEs and A levels. It doesn't have to be only university. It, it can in any direction. The idea is simple, right? It's community-based resources, you know, for students, by students. It's about embodying that spirit and any subject, any sort of level exam board can do it. Um, as soon as someone wants to work together on it, we will 100% get onto that.
one of the things we want to develop is a system which allows us to grow quicker because right now bottlenecks are really ourselves we the team is obviously going to do as much as possible as physically possible so we're gonna if we can create a system that kind of reduces the pressure or like the kind of the irrelevant stuff formatting and stuff like that which isn't really useful anyway if we can get that stuff out of the way and start making the actual notes and content development the kind of the key thing in our in our day-to-day activities then we should be able to expand as quick as possible those questions um kind of like go back to i mean questions on the AMA right now go to a bit about my A-level experiences so actually creating Xenos was just an, a method for me to what I needed to know for an exam I actually personally and I, I have a how to study article out there somewhere uh, the link can be put up at some point um, I actually rewrote my own notes again so after creating spending literally hours and days and moving certain pictures the cor- correct pixel size so that it would make this correct column width and so I did everything and at the end of the day the day before the exam I took handwritten notes in because for me the, the process by which I learn is kind of like a filtration method so what I do is I go I, I do the kind of the Xenos approach where I say this is exactly what the syllabus requires this is exactly what I need I cross check with past paper questions I make sure that there's nothing in the past papers which aren't which isn't already explained well enough on the notes once I have the kind of canon then I go through it over and over and over again, making sure that you know every little bit of excess information is cut out just so that I know exactly this is exactly what I need for the exam. And then what I do is I go and start thinking about, okay, you know, actually this topic is, I know it like the back of my hand, but I don't even want to study this anymore. And yet this topic is kind of is always like tripping me up. This kind of analysis itself is actually through the process of doing past papers and analyzing my effort because lots of us, do past papers. I, I know I was one of them. I would just do papers. I would look at Mark's teams, half fill them in. But the real way of doing it and beneficial way of doing it is if you can somehow like kind of discipline yourself, have a timetable to do the papers, but then also schedule times to actually go through those papers. And then once you go through those papers, make sure you identify where your weaknesses are, what were the questions. Even if you had to use the Mark team, that's fine. If you work backwards from the Mark team, you're that's a different type of learning technique. You know, you're going, it's called reverse learning. You're trying to work backwards and trying to work out from the method, how did they actually do that? And if you do that a couple of times, you're probably going to work out the, the normal method as well. So no harm in looking at the Mars team and examination reports and all that sort of stuff. But important to make sure that you actually realize and analyze those mistakes and efforts, where you're weak, where you're strong, and start kind of like creating this sort of heat map of, oh, this is my subject, this is what, looks really good this is what looks kind of weak um and then what i used to do is i'd go to my kind of line papers and write the notes out again and again and again and every time i'd write it out i'd lose bits of it so lose bits of it wasn't like i it was i was losing the bits which i knew really well and by the end of it so obviously the if you think about it this is kind of the way i thought about it the, the, the filter that's how it works so i had that three four hundred page textbook and filter down to the Z notes, 20, 30 pages long. It filtered down to my first set of handwritten notes, maybe like 20 pages long, 15 double-sided or something. And then filtered down again, five, six. And at the end of the day, I remember, probably still have them in some box. My mom has kept them somewhere probably. But my the notes that I carried the night or day before my exams were maybe two or three pages, maybe a double-sided page. And they just have the key definitions and things that I always forgot or ideas which are, or concepts which didn't really stick with me that well enough. And that's all I, I read for the last couple of hours before my exam. And then that would go away. And that's so um, there are different approaches to it. My approach is always, you know, go down this kind of route of um, going from all the information to filter it down, to filter it down. I don't know. You can visualize it, I think. But yeah. Um, anything specifically about these questions? Nothing specific. Okay. Um, and that's how I went through my IG's ASNA too. And I've kind of some bits of um, A levels, uh, university exams as well. Um, did you start a couple of, uh, well, obviously at class in my classroom, I'd handwrite the notes so that I'd type them up and then I'd go back to handwrite. I always go, I think at the end of the day, I've tried um, lots of techniques but I always go back to handwritten notes my 
oh my gosh, even on my desk right now, they're like piles of paper on line notes so that this all Henderson. I literally, um, so for example, some of the things I'm doing right now, like learning theorems and proofs for certain examinations, I, I've written out the proof about 50 times, 20 times, 30 times at least. And, and some of the, some of the things I've written out are illegible. Literally, if I send, I, I don't know, I read it, but it's just this action of writing. I, and oh, people think I'm weird probably, but um, all my train journeys or walking around trying to read the notes, I, I'm writing with my finger in the air. And that's how I, the action of writing is itself is some, something that sticks with me. So I don't know about scientific studies, but this is what works for me. Thanks for joining the AMA, everyone. I hope it was useful and informative. We will be running more sessions like this, hopefully every week. There will be a feedback on one of the channels on Discord where you can send us some more information about how you felt. And hopefully we'll be seeing you next time. Bye-bye.